Well. Welcome to the Oxford Union, Dame. Um, I thought probably we should start by taking a dial back in time a little and get to know yourself. Could you take us back to why and when and why you discovered your love for science? It happened quite early. Um, formerly, it happened at about age 11, 12. Um, but I can see with hindsight that my father was cultivating it, <clears throat> excuse me, even before that. My father was an architect, and one of the things architects have to do is survey the plot, the ground, where they're going to build a building. And he used me as his surveying assistant. So I got to stand in the bed of nettles with the pole while he stayed by the theodolite and took the reading. And he had a good pattern. We worked round in a circle, so we ended up where we began. And going home in the car, he would let me reduce the observations, and I'd say, Dad, we ended up a foot higher than we started. No, we didn't. Check your arithmetic. So I learned quite a lot about design of experiments from him, I can see with hindsight. Um, but the, the real crunch came when I moved into secondary school. And the first week of the first term, message went round the class on Wednesday morning, this afternoon, boys to that place, girls to that place. And I thought, this is sport. That's why they're separating us. It wasn't. They sent the boys to the science lab and the girls to the cookery room. No discussion, no choice. Uh, my parents had promised me I'd get to do science when I got into the secondary school. So I said to the domestic science teacher, I thought I should be in the science class, but she wasn't hearing anything of it. When I told my parents that evening, they hit the roof. They phoned the head teacher, as did the local doctor who had a daughter in my class, as did one other set of parents. And the next time the science class met, there were three girls and all the boys. And I believe we were the first girls that teacher had ever taught. And clearly we were dynamite. He made us sit right up against his desk at the front. We did physics that first term. I loved it. I came top of the class. And did the, head, did the science teacher praise me? No. He lambasted the boys for allowing a girl to beat them. But clearly I could do science and I loved it. So that was my introduction. Amazing, that's such an inspiring and very, very uh, touching um, I'm story. Could you take, take us back to how that experience, the fact that you had to fight and your parents have to, ha had to get involved in, in fighting for your place in, in class and even when you did well, it wasn't attributed to you. It was more so that the teachers thought that the, the, the male students did so badly. How did that affect your self-perception at that young age? It was the first instance of a pattern that was going to repeat itself over and over again. Um, I, I knew I'd come top of the class, so I, it, in a sense it said more about the teacher to me than it said about me, that, that response that he had. Yeah. Thank you. So after the right experience, you clearly went on to do really well in your class. You went on to university, and I believe you were one of the, uh, well, one in the class of 50 of the only uh, woman in that class. Yeah, I went to University of Glasgow to read physics. I had already decided I wanted to be a radio astronomer, and a physics degree was a good entry for that. And if I wasn't good enough to do a PhD, it was going to be a good degree for getting a job. So I was doing a physics degree, and in the final two honours years of the four-year course, I ended up the only female in the class, 49 men and me. And in Glasgow University at that time, certainly in science and engineering, where there were very few women, it was the tradition that when a woman walked into the lecture theatre, and it would work beautifully in this room, all the guys whistled, stamped, catcalled, banged the wooden desks, made as much noise as they could. And if you blushed, they got even more enthusiastic. So I had to learn to control my blushing. You can control your blushing, 
Uh, I think I've probably lost the technique again, but I had to at that point, because that at least prevented an excess of noise. But it was one hell of a racket. Um, everybody else in the department must have known exactly what was going on. And none of the lecturers or anybody saw fit to say anything, do anything. It was what happened at Glasgow University at that time. It was the norm. Wow. You spoke in the past about having experienced imposter syndrome. And I think as students in Oxford, um, each one of us uh, has at some point come across that yeah. statement, um, feeling that you don't belong somewhere. But in your case, it wasn't just a mental voice in your head. There was physical representation in feeling as if you did not belong there. How did that affect you? And what was your strategy to overcome that at that time? It became much more of an issue when I moved from Glasgow to Cambridge to do a PhD. And I dare say the same thing might well have happened if I'd come to Oxford, but it was actually to Cambridge because I wanted to be a radio astronomer and the, the radio astronomy um, was done there. At that time in Cambridge, there were very few women. There were three women's colleges and about three dozen men's colleges. I noted that the fellows in my woman's college, it was called Newhall then, it's now Murray Edwards, the fellows all refer to themselves as Miss or Mrs, not as doctor or professor. And I put that alongside the very severe caution we all had when we matriculated about behaving ourselves. I think what was going on was there were very few women in Cambridge. The few women dons that there were were keen that there should be more. But if we, the students, misbehaved, there was a severe risk there'd be fewer, not more. The men would say, trust women, you know, and clamp down on there being more women in Cambridge. And in terms of the fellows' titles, there was one female fellow in Girton who called herself Professor, Professor Bradbury. And the fellows in my college felt that was a bit forward. And I think actually what was going on was the women were trying not to scare the men. So they weren't advertising that they had PhDs or that they were professors. And they con continued to call themselves Miss or Mrs. Because the men in Cambridge held all the power. And if you wanted there to be places for more women, more women's colleges, you had not to make the men too anxious. Oh, wow. Um, could you tell us about why perhaps you moved away from the Northern Ireland education to Cambridge and, and, and Glasgow in, 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 in the sense that did you feel as if um, at that point in time you might have been maybe much more accepted more than you were at Northern Ireland in university institutions or what, what motivated well, it was, that? It wasn't all my choice. Some of it was my parents' decision. Um, the education in our local town was not good. I remember coming home from the primary class um, I was in a very, very small primary section, just two classes, like a country school. I remember coming home one day telling my parents, we were learning about Persephone today. And mother said, what? And I said, Persephone. She said, you mean Persephone? The teacher had told us we pronounced that word Persephone. There then followed an interesting discussion with my mother about how we could tactfully <laughs> correct the teacher. Because <laughs> we had to read back that piece of reading to the teacher next day. Um, so the education in my little town in Northern Ireland was not very good. And parents had always intended that all four of us kids would go away to boarding school in England. And we did all. We went to the Quaker boarding schools in York, my brother to Bootham and us girls to the Mount. Now, girls' boarding schools had trouble getting science teachers. Um, in fact, the A-level biology class, the girls went to the boys' school, Bootham, for that class. Um, we had a brilliant physics teacher. He'd come out of retirement for a second time to teach us, and he was just such a clear teacher. The chemistry teacher, I think, did not know of the periodic table. <laughs> 
we would ask him, you know, why do hydrogen and sulfur and oxygen combine to make sulfuric acid? And he'd say, God made it so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll go on to talk about religion uh, since you sort of like touched on that. And I, I recognize that, you know, you are a uh, Protestant Christian, uh, Protestant um, Quaker. Um, how, how you, I think you, you wrote um, in an academic, you give an academic lecture, um, which was published in a book, A Quaker Astronomer Reflects, and uh, can scientists be also be religious? Mm -hmm. I wonder throughout your career, um, what role um, God or religion has played in both um, the work you do and also in a personal sense, pushing through um, the diversity and the challenges that came your way? Yeah, um, Quakers incidentally might hesitate slightly at the Christian label. I mean, we are not um, Islamic or Hindu or any of the other world faiths. We are Western world largely um, in a Christian ambiance, but sometimes the label Christian has a very evangelical overtone to it, um, and Quakers would resist that um, element of it. Um, Quakerism is important to me in my personal life. I don't think it affects my professional life. Um, Quakers are very open about science. There have been a lot of eminent Quaker scientists. Um, one interesting thing for Oxford folk, some of you may have come across the name Dorothy Crowford Hodgkin. She was an Oxford chemist. Um, she and I are the only women to have ever won the Royal Society's Copley Medal, founded in 1731 or something like that. Two women in 400 years. Not only was she Oxford, she was Quaker. It's not a tradition of Quakers uh, breaking boundaries and glass ceilings. Well, being open to um, new phenomena, new ideas, new phenomena, I think is perhaps could you tell us more about how that, how that played a role more in, I guess, going back to 1967, you discovering that phenomena that others thought was something else and delving further into that and then discovering the radio pulsar? Yeah. Um, when I moved to Cambridge, I didn't honestly expect to get into Cambridge. I was trying for University of Manchester, but they never replied. And I took that as a no because I'd been told that they wouldn't take women. So I thought that's their way of not taking women. So I thought, actually, I'm going to have to go to Australia to do this PhD, Australia being the next biggest centre for radio astronomy. But the academic year in Australia, in the Southern Hemisphere, doesn't begin till January, February. And so I had some months in hand and I thought I'll put in an application to Cambridge just in case. And very much to my surprise, got in. Um, and you turn up in Cambridge, and maybe some of you felt this when you came here as freshers. You turn up in Cambridge, and everybody seems terribly bright, terribly confident, thoroughly in control of everything. And you're this nervous little so-and-so from the fringes of the United Kingdom. And you think, my God, they've made a mistake admitting me. I'm not, you know, of this caliber. Uh, and we now name this, it's called imposter syndrome. And those of us who work in Oxford or Cambridge colleges know to look out for imposter syndrome, particularly at the beginning of this term, when there are freshers who may suddenly decide that, oh, they've made a mistake admitting me. I can't cope here, I'd better go home. And if you don't act quickly, they've gone home within the first week of term. Well, I'd had a battle to get where I got, and I wasn't going to take myself home. But I was pretty certain they'd made a mistake admitting me. I was pretty certain they'd discover their mistake and throw me out. So my game plan was to work my very hardest so that when they threw me out, I'd know I'd done my best. And it wasn't that I'd wasted an opportunity. So I was being very, very thorough, very careful. And that attitude lasted a lot more than just, you know, the first few weeks of the first year. It lasted right through my PhD. 
Amazing, amazing. Um, when you were on the research project and working on the uh, 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 what, what, what eventually led to you discovering the radio pulsar, did you n know at that point in time immediately that you discovered something extraordinary? How did it all come about in that instant? Again, I was being extremely thorough for reasons that I have explained. Um, and I, a group of about six of us spent two years building this telescope, building the kit, and then I was the grad student that got to use it. Okay, I had to debug it and get it going, but it wasn't too difficult to debug, and I got it going. And I very quickly became used to recognizing the, the signals that I was, of the things I was meant to be observing. And a radio telescope is a large collecting area, very sensitive, will pick up any radio signal going from miles and miles around. So you get interference. Cars in those days were badly suppressed and a car driving down the local road would give radio interference. Um, these days, aircraft altimeters are quite a problem because they give radio interference. Um, Satellites give radio interference. There are lots and lots of things in this world. Anything that sparks, um, for instance, gives radio interference. So you get used to identifying radio interference. But I was still being incredibly thorough and incredibly pedantic. It has come really ingrained by my third year. <laughs> and I noticed that there was another kind of signal that the telescope was picking up, which didn't look like one of the quasars that I was meant to be identifying and didn't look like interference that I was meant to be rejecting. And I showed it to my supervisor and said, well, yeah, Jocelyn, sure, but it only takes up a quarter inch on the charts. And I had five kilometers of chart by the end of the exercise. So, you know, quarter inch isn't big. And he said, it's all jammed together. You can't see what's going on. We need an enlargement. With chart recorders, you know, rolls of paper spewing out under pens, it's very easy to get an enlargement. You run the paper faster under the pen and everything gets enlarged. So my job became going out to the observatory shortly before we were due to observe this funny signal, whatever it was, switching to a high-speed recording, have the recorder spew out chart, and then go back to the, the rest of the normal observing. And as luck would had it, um, this thing disappeared for a month. I spent a whole month making these recordings. And of course, my supervisor was cross and it was all my fault. You know, it's a flare star, it's been gone and done it, and you've missed it, um, kind of supportive remark. And then finally, one day I got it and it went pulse, 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 a bit like a heartbeat one pulse every one and a third seconds. And I waited till the telescope had turned away from that bit of sky, switched back to normal, phoned my supervisor. He said, oh, well, that settles it, it's interference. Because we didn't know of anything that behaved like that. It came out the next day, stood looking over my shoulder to see if it would come again. Unfortunately, it did come again. Um, and it was going at the same rate. It hadn't, you know, got tired and slowed down. And that began a whole series of special observations to try and understand what the heck this thing was, because it moved around the stars with the moved around the sky with the stars. You probably know that in the night sky in summer you see a different set of constellations from the night sky in winter. That's because the stars go round in 23 hours, 56 minutes. They get four minutes earlier each day. It's not a 24 hour day. So over a year, well, over six months, the, the stars that are in the night sky, the stars are in the night, day sky have changed because of this four minutes a day shift. And this thing was coming four minutes earlier each day. It was keeping its place amongst the stars. So it was either a star or it was other astronomers, because astronomers sometimes keep the 23-hour, 56-minute day. <laughs> we couldn't find any other astronomers doing anything, so it began to look like it was some funny kind of star. And then, fortunately, I found a second, and a third, and a fourth. And then it begins to look like a new kind of star, 
We still don't know what it is. But while it's a one-off, it could be interference, it could be something really uh, special, anomalous, peculiar. But once you've got four, you've got the beginnings of a population and you feel much happier. So that, that telescope only ever found one more after that. But other telescopes have found many and we now know of several thousand. So <laughs> wow. What a remarkable display of like tenacity, diligence, and perseverance in that. Um, of course, we know that seven years later um, that uh, discovery of yours uh, was awarded a Nobel Prize in physics and um, people who were working alongside yourself, your supervisors, uh, received it and you didn't. Um, people have talked about the controversy in a lot. I wonder, how did you feel and what was the process of your emotions in that, at that point in time? It was an amazing day um, between my finishing my PhD and, and then I had got married, had a child, um, moved a couple of times and I was currently working in X-ray astronomy, detecting X-rays from stars and things in the sky. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to get your kit above the Earth's atmosphere. So it means a satellite. And the lab I was working in, part of University College London, uh, had a major role in a satellite which had launched that morning, eight o'clock in the morning. And we'd all come into the lab early to listen to the launch. There weren't video links then, but there was an audio launch. And we sat there and we heard all the tests and going through the stages and the countdown and the launch. And it looked as if it had launched successfully. We gradually all disappeared off. The first to go were the computer programmer saying, it looks as if it's going to be okay. I'd better finish that program. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but gradually we all dis drifted off to our offices. And at about noon, a colleague came rushing into my office. Have you heard the news? Have you heard the news? And I thought, oh my God, the satellite's failed. It's gone in the drink. It wasn't. It was the announcement of that Nobel Prize. So that was a, a really rather peculiar day to have two things like that happening. Um, my colleague expected, I think, steam to come out of my ears or something like that, but actually I was pleased. There is no Nobel Prize in astronomy or astrophysics. There's only the physics Nobel Prize that's even half relevant. And up till then, the Nobel Physics Committee had never given the prize to anybody within a hundred miles of astronomy. So this was a huge step that they had recognized that there's good physics in astronomy and astrophysics. And I recognized that immediately and I was really, really pleased. So um, a lot of other people were very cross on my behalf. And I remember calling the Cambridge department um, to say congratulations. And of course, they were getting lots of phone calls and it went to one of the junior secretaries who said, just a minute, Jocelyn, I'm going to hand you over to Molly, the senior secretary. So I think the secretaries were perhaps scared that I was going to be angry. And they had arranged that the senior secretary would deal with me. <laughs> but actually, I, I, was, I was very pleased. But what a day. <laughs> oh, I'm, I, that sounds euphoric. Um, of course, since then, um, rightfully, um, you've been recognised for your work and you've received a lot of prizes. Um, in 2018, you awarded the Special Breakthrough Prize for, for Fundamental Physics um, for your postal work. And that came with, I believe, a $3 million um, um, gift, which you immediately decided to donate to causes of women and ethnic minorities in science? Slightly more um, subtle than that. Um, I thought if we could get more minority people doing PhDs in physics, maybe they too would suffer imposter syndrome. Maybe too they would work like the clappers and discover something. So the money went to the Institute of Physics for PhD studentships for people from minority unconventional backgrounds, which includes women, um, could include refugees. Um, this year includes somebody with, um, I was going to say Alzheimer's, wrong word. Um, 
syndrome. <laughs> Lost the word. But anyway, um, with a serious, serious syndrome. Um, it's only in its second year, but they awarded four studentships the first year uh, and eight this year. And I also included refugees as the cat of a category of people that they should look at. Um, so, yeah, the Institute of Physics is, is handling that and I think doing so very well. That's impressive. That's really good. Obviously, in this quest, you're dealing with um, two-pronged issues, um, the access uh, for women in science, but also those who are uh, minorities in, in different ways and those who are disenfranchised like refugees. Um, but that's you doing work. What do you think perhaps universities like Oxford and Cambridge and, and so on need to do to improve um, the, uh, I guess, sort of imposter syndrome um, for, for those people, but more importantly, improve access for them to get involved in science? Uh, this university has become very, very conscious of gender issues over the time I've been here. And now they're also beginning to fold race into that which is good and long overdue. Um, I'm not sure yet whether they fully address the needs of people with disabilities, for example. Um, and I don't know if anybody has a program to take refugee students, but that's another category that I, I, I was brought up, I was born during the war and I was brought up in a household that contained two refugees, a German Jew and uh, what was the other one? White Russian. So refugees have kind of been part of my consciousness from a very, very early age. So I've included refugees in the instructions to the Institute of Physics for that. But I don't think they've found any refugees wanting to do PhDs in physics just yet. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I guess the issue of access is quite complex and dealing with things earlier on sometimes is, is helpful as well. And, and, and that's really, that's really, really, really admirable. Um, I know that the work, I know that things that currently have obviously different, were different back to, back in the, to back in the sixties, um, according to the UIS data, um, there's about 30% of women in, um, world, women in the world who are, uh, in research. I wanted to ask, um, whether you're shocked by that data, whether you think that uh, it's gone a lot further than you would have expected when you were at university. It's certainly moved um, in British universities. I was one of a small group of senior women scientists who set up the Athena Swan scheme. Uh, about half a dozen of us met after work at our own expense in London, sort of thinking, what the heck can we do to, you know, get more women into science? And uh, having got them into universities to make sure that they stayed and stayed the course. And one of us was a bit of a psychologist. And she said, you know, vice chancellors, they're very competitive guys. They were all men at that stage. If we create a prize for the most women-friendly university, they'll compete. <laughs> now, we were penniless, but we managed to afford a glass rose bowl, and we announced this competition. And she was right. They competed. And we did it for two or three years, and the number of universities entering gradually grew. And out of that, from what we learned doing that, we created this Athena Swan scheme, which was an award scheme for universities to recognize those that were working hard or being successful at advancing women in the university, not just students, but faculty as well. And then um, the research funding bodies became interested. And once funders, people with money, start getting concerned about these matters. Boy, attitudes shift remarkably fast. Um, so funders started getting interested and then it started to include arts and humanities, where the question is not where are the women, but where are the men? And it gradually grew and grew and grew. Um, probably got a bit too big for its boots, so to speak. Um, and there's a bit of a pullback now because it's turned out to be 
rather too big a load to compile the cases. And guess what? They often asked women, women members of faculty, to compile the cases for their departments. It is a big, big job. Um, but it spread to Ireland, it spread to Canada, it spread to Australia, and it's coming in in the USA where it's not just gender but also race. So it's been an interesting piece of work. That's, that's, that's incredible. That's very groundbreaking, um, the work you did there. Uh, you obviously have campaigned a lot in your work, both in your existence. At the moment, we have people here in the audience, and I'm sure they're eager to ask uh, plenty, plenty questions. I wonder, before we go into audience questions, whether you had any advice that you'd give either a refugee student, um, a minor ethnic student, or a woman as to succeed in ac academia. I think my main message is hang in there. Um, with persistence, you will get through it. Um, it's not easy. Um, Oxford and Cambridge are pretty tough because of these very short terms. So it's all happening very, very fast. But uh, my main, main message is hang in there. It will work out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open the floor now to questions. Sure, I recognize that one. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us. Um, your talk was very enjoyable. Um, I was very interested, I was a basic science researcher before coming here. So um, hearing you talk about your, uh, you know, how you discovered pulsars within, you know, a quarter of an inch within a five kilometer tape seems very incredible. Um, what was, uh, how did you realize that this was a new scientific phenomenon and not something, you know, a mistake or some sort of other interference? Um, it was pretty clear even from the first recording that showed the pulses because the period was short and the pulses were quite steep-sided. And even by day two, we could see that the pulse rate was the same. The thing hadn't got tired. And we went on for quite a few weeks, months, and it kept pulsing at the same rate. So it's not getting tired but the small pulse period and the steep pulses imply it's small. So it's small, but it's got bags of energy. It's not obvious how to reconcile those two until you learn about neutron stars, which are very, very compact stars. Stars squashed into a ball about 10 miles across. So you begin to suspect something's rather funny right from when you see the pulses, the train of pulses. And certainly by day two, when you see it's still going at the same rate. So it's small, but it's got bags of energy. Obvious what that is, isn't it? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we have another question? I recognize that member. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, you talked about your struggles early in your career being a woman and the fact you kind of pushed aside the fact of that. Now, sorry, now looking back into your career and having had the recognition um, that you've got, and I know in certainly people I've spoke to, you are quite a big figure in physics now, uh, not in specifically astrophysics. Do you kind of feel like that? Or do you feel kind of your roots are still kind of where you're at? Or feel, should I say? Thanks. Yeah. Um I don't personally feel very comfortable with being a, a big person, so to speak, in a field. Um, so I try not to put that center stage, should I say. But I have to admit it has opened up a lot of interesting opportunities. You know, I get invitations to go places and lecture. So right now, Tanya, my... PA and I are trying to fix up a visit to Salt Lake City, Utah, in January, February, soon, soon, maybe before that, um, to go to a meeting and give a big talk. So there's lots of fun. Um, and a few weeks ago, I was rattling around Spain giving talks. So that's, you know, great privilege to get to visit some of these places. And I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I recognize that member over there. 
Thank you so much for coming to the union. Um, I was wondering uh, what you see for the future of radio astronomy, um, especially in terms of the uh, recent collapse of the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, which was a huge loss. And I'm wondering, uh, as part of that future, um, if a great development would be to put radio telescopes on the moon or other bodies in the solar system, which would enable us perhaps to get a different, hopefully better, um, way of hearing what's out there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, there are a number of biggish new radio telescopes developing here on Earth. Um, South Africa um, and Australia are between them going to have radio telescope with an area of a square kilometer, which is quite a lot of collecting power. Um, but there have also been from time to time ideas about putting radio telescopes on the far side of the moon, um, because then the, the body of the moon would shield radio interference from here on Earth. Because one of the, the issues we have, one of many issues we have as humanity, is we want more of the electromagnetic spectrum for our mobile phones and things, please. Whilst the radio astronomers want bits of the electromagnetic spectrum kept empty, so that they can pick up the faint signals from the cosmos. So there's a lot of pressure on the electromagnetic spectrum. Thank you. Can I have that speaker there? Following the recent image of the first black hole, and especially after that was published, there was a lot of research about spinning black holes, especially that spewed out matter and very high energy particles from the two edges of it that wasn't spinning around the axis of spin. Do you think that your research on the radio pulsars, which actually behave in a kind of a similar way, might affect how we view these black holes and or is there a connection between these two stellar objects? I think the existence of pulsars, radio pulsars, which uh, have mass like a body of the sun, but all crammed into a 10 kilometer radius ball. They've made black holes seem much more plausible. And we are now discovering black holes a lot, um, particularly through gravitational radiation, um, and learning a lot more about them. But that's often the way a subject advances. Um, developments in one area will then quite possibly affect a contingent area and, and lead to the development of it. So, yeah, the existence of pulsars made black holes seem much more likely, much more plausible. So people are more willing to recognize black holes when they see them because of the existence of pulsars. Yes, that member with the Baleo jacket. Just here. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm wondering, how did you come about your passion for astrophysics? And say during your research career, were there any times when you felt lost when the research just wasn't delivering the results that you were hoping to see? And if so, how did you come about? How do you um, overcome the struggle and maintain your passion for science? It was quite clear from when we started science at school age, 12 or 13, that I was good at physics. Chemistry was okay. I hated what they called biology. They gave us flowers to draw, label the parts, learn the names. Oh, you've done that flower. Here's another one. Draw this flower, label the parts, learn the names. And uh, so I decided physical sciences were much more interesting than biology or botany. Uh, and I think that's where my talents lay as well. Um, I nearly changed to geology. At Glasgow University, you had to do a breadth of subjects in the first couple of years. And I had a choice between something biological and geology, and I chose geology and came top of the class without trying. I thought, hmm, not doing that well in physics. The lads made sure I never came top in physics. <laughs> Maybe I should switch to geology. And went to talk to the professor who was head of the geology department. He said, no, not for women. 
At that point, they were exploring for oil in Burma. That was the cutting edge of geology work. And of course, there aren't ladies' toilets in the jungle in Burma, so clearly I couldn't be a geologist. I subsequently learned that women of my generation at other universities who were good at geology were encouraged to do geology. So if I'd been somewhere else, I might have become a geologist. But since geology in Glasgow wouldn't have me, I stuck with physics and stuck with physics. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I recognize the member with the white fluffy jacket. <laughs> Okay, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is that um, during your PhD study, we all know we, we are not guaranteed to f actually find something during all of us, like PhD degree. So before you, f you had your exciting finding, like how you said you were going really thorough with it, but how do you keep, like how did you keep that enthusiasm doing that? Thank you. Maybe I'm just a stubborn old git. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I recognize the lady with the black jacket. Thank you so much, Dame Jocelyn. Um, I have a question, I guess, relating to whether you have a dream or a goal currently that you're working towards or chasing. Uh, no, I don't. I'm, um, I'm pushing 80. Um, and I've stopped doing my own research but I am trying to keep up with certain parts of contemporary astrophysics. Um, because of my pulsar background, I'm interested in what we call time domain, how things change with time and how things change quite rapidly with time. And it's a very exciting area of astrophysics at the moment. Um, it, it, we are discovering that from galaxies out there in space, there can suddenly be zip, a very short radio burst. Maybe repeated, but probably not. And then from another galaxy over there, there's another fast radio burst. And one from there, and one from there. And this is a fairly new field. It's only been going a few years. It grew out of the pulsar field because the pulsar people are used to picking up blip, 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 so it's the same technology, only these don't repeat. And they're much, much further away than the pulsars that we're dealing with. They're definitely way beyond our galaxy. So this is a very exciting and dynamic field, which I'm not personally researching in, but I'm watching very carefully. Um, there's still a huge amount of excitement, particularly in what we call time domain, how things change with time. It used to be in the old days with telescopes, you had to take very long exposures. You had to integrate for a long time because the detectors weren't very sensitive. And if you take a very long exposure, you miss the fact that the thing goes wee, 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 wee in the middle of your exposure. It just gets averaged out. Now we can take many short exposures and we're discovering quite a lot of things go wee, 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 <laughs> and so on. Um, and in many cases, we have very little clue exactly what's going on. But that's fun. So that's a field that I'm particularly watching at the moment, this developing time domain in astrophysics. And it's not just in the radio, um, in the optical as well. They're finding lots of things that flare up and die quite suddenly. And whether they're related to the things flaring up and dying in the radio remains to be seen. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on that, um, on the question and sort of like space exploration and sort of um, given that right now we have um, two big billionaires in the world uh, promising to, to colonize Mars and, and so on. I wonder what your, what your view is on um, maybe exploring space and maybe whether you'd like to visit um, uh, another planet uh, if you had a chance to. I'm not very interested in going to Mars, to be honest, <laughs> particularly since at the moment it would probably be a one-way journey. Indeed, I'm surprised that anybody wants to go to Mars on a one-way journey. If it were a short visit and a guaranteed return trip, that would be a different matter. Um, 
I don't have great urge, actually, to get in a spaceship and go anywhere. Um, because there's so much we can still do from the Earth with improving kit here on Earth. More and more things are opening up. We're finding better and better ways to see things, research things. So there's plenty at the moment of excitement and interesting things to do without climbing in a spaceship and going somewhere. Um, I recognize there are people who maybe do want to. Um, okay. Do you really want to? Are you sure? <laughs> okay, I suppose so. <laughs> but not for me, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I guess the idea is sort of cool. Sure, the gentleman with the colorful jacket and black gloves. <laughs> yes, hello. My, my question is related to, you mentioned quite a lot this evening about diversity in in science and particularly in physics i'm just wondering if different types of people are able to see things differently and maybe solve physics problems in a different way so that different different types of problem might be open to um someone from from a particular background so that, that's sort of an argument for greater diversity in physics i'm just thinking in, in particular when you, you came across your first data on pulsars you know perhaps you and your supervisor thought differently about it because of your different backgrounds although you know by as it went on and the data appeared then uh, anyway that's my question thank you yes i i think the more diverse ways of thinking you have in a research group, the more successful that research group is likely to be. And interestingly, in the USA, there have been studies by a company called McKinsey, McKinsey and Co, um, who have researched successful businesses. And they have found that the most successful and the most robust businesses are those that are the most diverse in their, their staff, their, their people. Um, but a diverse group is harder to manage. The easiest kind of group to manage is a group of people exactly like yourself, because to you they're reasonably predictable. But actually what's going to be most successful is the exact opposite, a really diverse group where there aren't lots of people like you. Uh, but it does mean we all need better management skills than perhaps we have been expected to have in the past because it, it is a harder group to manage. Mm. Super, finally, so I'm sure some PPS wants to be consulted. We're gonna gain a lot from that. Um, so yes, gentleman with the uh, face mask. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so you mentioned early on how uh, you were born in Northern Ireland during the war and how you spent your early life there. So I was wondering, like, as you progressed your uh, career in physics, uh, whether it was like impacted in any way by like the violence that uh, broke out there during the seventies and eighties, concerning it was like still home for you. Yeah, and it's not totally gone even now, and it might come back. Um, Northern Ireland is a fairly um, fragile place in the sense of being peaceful or being violent. Um, so it, it's basically um, an Ulster Protestant pro-British and uh, a Catholic pro-Republic of Ireland. That's, that's the roots of the division. Uh, and there have been various botched political decisions in Ireland. I mean, the creation of Northern Ireland itself was, uh, well, a flattering way is make, do and mend, but actually I think it botched is a better description of how it was done, um, with six counties of Ireland being British and the rest being Irish. And the six counties being nominally Protestant, but with a huge Roman Catholic, not quite minority or, or just minority, you know, it's pretty evenly balanced. And unfortunately, recently, um, partly Brexit pressures maybe other ones as well. Um, it looks as if the violence and the sectarianism is on the up again, which is very concerning. 
and not well understood over here. I don't know, do you have Northern Irish roots? Absolutely. Now you've got more understanding than many a Brit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so fragile, concerning. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, Dame, it's been a true pleasure and I'd like us all to join me in thanking her for visiting us today.